It's finally Halloween. You're four days late, babe. But go off, I guess. Which is the perfect time of year to watch a scary movie. Whether you rewatch classics like Friday the 13th or Nightmare on Elm Street, or if you're like me and you like rewatching Disney Channel original Halloween movies solely for nostalgia purposes, just know that no movie you watch this Halloween will ever be scarier than the horror that is 2020. Hi, welcome to this week's video. <coughs> So I love a good horror movie, especially around this time of year. But one thing I love more than a good horror movie is a bad horror movie. And I think I found the perfect one to talk about today. So I was scrolling through Netflix about a week or so ago, and I came across this movie called Haunting on Fraternity Row. Based on the title, I figured that the plot of this movie was going to be about you guessed it, a fraternity. The thought of Greek life alone sends a shiver down my spine, so like, I knew I was going to be in for a fright. But now that I've seen it twice, I'm more terrified at how f terrible this was. In short, this movie is like the Blair Witch Project meets Project X meets a dumpster fire. Mix in a few stereotypical frat bros and sorority sisters and boom, you have Haunting on Fraternity Row. But despite the cheesy acting and the terrible writing, which <laughs> we'll get into, like, I can't say that I wasn't entertained. Like, I would be lying if I said I wasn't engaged the entire hour and 38 minutes I was watching. So with that being said, let's get into the train wreck that is Haunting on Fraternity Row. So the majority of this movie is filmed using the shaky camera technique, which is why I brought up the Blair Witch Project comparison earlier. And if you don't know what the shaky camera technique is, basically it's when stable image techniques are purposely dispensed with. It is a handheld camera or given the appearance of being handheld, and in many cases, shots are limited to what one photographer could have accomplished with one camera. Shaky cam is often employed to give a film sequence an ad hoc, electronic news gathering, or documentary film feel. It suggests unprepared, unrehearsed filming of reality and can provide a sense of dynamics, immersion, instability, or nervousness. So I'm going to be showing quite a few clips of this shaky camera technique because I'm gonna be showing clips of the movie. So if that kind of stuff bothers you, just make sure to skip those parts or look away from those parts of the video. I just wanted to give a warning now because I know some people don't like it. So Haunting on Fraternity Row features, surprise, surprise, a fraternity. I'm sure you guessed that by now. And this fraternity is called Sigma Tau and they're from some unspecified college in the United States. Wow, who would have guessed? Not me. The film starts off in the middle of a 911 call reporting several deaths at the Sigma Tau fraternity house. But before we know how this happens, let's rewind back several hours. After this clip of the ominous 911 call, we cut to one of the pledges named Wiggles filming around the frat house on a small camcorder until he gets to the bathroom where Dougie, another brother in Sigma Tau, pops out of the bathroom closet wearing a bunny suit. Their plan is to scare Tanner, who is in the next room playing video games with headphones on. So then Dougie pops up from behind Tanner to scare him. Tanner flips out so much that he snaps Dougie's neck and Dougie collapses onto the floor. At this point, this is the very first instance of cheesy acting in this movie and we're barely three minutes in. Specifically, Tanner right here is the main culprit. The writers made him the most stereotypical frat boy times a thousand. Okay, you know what? Let's do a group exercise right now. I want you, the viewer right now, to close your eyes and think about what a stereotypical frat boy in your mind looks like and how he behaves. And exaggerate that to the fullest extent. Once you do that, you've got our boy Tanner over here. And trust me, he gives us some of the most iconic cringe scenes throughout this entire film just like this first scene we're about to discuss. In this part, Tanner, who, let me establish, has the IQ of a meatball, runs up to the camera and says, But it turns out, <laughs> it was just a prank. You know that funny prank where you pretend to kill your friend? I mean, we've all tried that at one point. After Tanner and Dougie scared the living bejesus out of Wiggles, they take a walk around the house for a little bit and we get a sense of the environment that they live in. At one point, we come across a different pledge standing in the corner of a hallway with toilet paper wrapped around his head. Tanner addresses this kid as asswipe, which I guess explains the toilet paper on his head. We get to Dougie's bedroom where we also meet Jason, who's like the goody two shoes of the frat. And they wake Jason up by blowing smoke into his mouth. The three brothers go downstairs and there's a bunch of pledges filming them. 
We find out that Sigma Tau is preparing for their luau, which is the biggest party of the year, and Dougie plans on filming it and turning it into a movie. Jason doesn't want this movie to get out because he just applied to med school and he's waiting to hear if he got accepted or not. Then the boys are hanging out in the kitchen and Grant, the president of Sigma Tau, I might add, walks in. Grant just got back from working with his girlfriend Liza's father, who is a banker on Wall Street. He hopes that by networking with Liza's father, he can land a job on Wall Street after he graduates. When I start mounting gold, you get a jet ski. Hey. You get a jet ski. You get a jet ski. You get a jet ski. Everyone gets a jet ski. After this, there's a weird scene of Jason and Dougie talking in the bathroom while Jason is showering, and I'll just play the clip. Have you been shitting this whole time? Dude, I'm not shitting. I'm pooping. All right, there's a big difference. So right in the water, there's no smell. I probably don't even have to wipe. I beg your pardon? You're a grown man. Do we need to potty train you again? I know there's that rumor right now that some straight men don't wipe their asses because it's gay or seen as feminine, but can we not promote that behavior? While Sigma Tau is preparing for the luau, the Kappa Lambda Phi sorority, which I'm just gonna call KLP for the rest of this review. Anyway, so the KLP sorority walks in and Liza, Grant's girlfriend, also happens to be the president of KLP. Then Maggie, who, mind you, is the female version of Tanner, asks, Uh, sober as fuck? Where's the booth? Not to jump ahead too much, but Maggie and Tanner have this very weird sexual tension throughout the film, which we'll definitely see more of later, but I just want to let you know this dynamic is very weird between them. Anyway, back to Liza. The writers managed to make her one of the most unlikable characters I've ever seen in a movie. These characters are the archetypes of frat brothers and sorority sisters, and that is especially true for Liza, and you'll see right now. She's portrayed to be the most stereotypical wealthy and privileged college student, but her dialogue is so exaggerated to the point where she's like a caricature of a sorority sister. And I'll show you what I mean right now. I brought my pledges to help set up the f luau. I mean, they'll clean toilets, do dishes, laundry, get these dirty. Uh, I know, we don't need them to clean the toilets. We got no, Grant, seriously, these girls suck. <laughs> And the dialogue just gets even worse when she's addressing the pledges of KLP. You think you're good enough for Kappa Lambda Phi, but you're literally the most boring, awkward group of sluts I've ever seen. I want this place sparkling. Okay. Now! What a specific insult. It's like the writers were determined to make Liza the worst person ever, so they just threw a bunch of random insults together hoping that she'd sound like a so now both Sigma Tau and KLP are setting up the house for the luau, and there's another scene showing the tension between Maggie and Tanner, as demonstrated by Maggie's very over-exaggerated lip bite. Around this time, we also start to see the tension between Jason and Claire, who is a sister of KLP. Claire is like Jason in a sense, where she's the goody two-shoes of her sorority, and we see their relationship manifest throughout the film. Now we get to the scene where Two of the Sigma Tau pledges are trying to carry a heavy beer keg outside while the other brothers are yelling at them. Then the poor pledges drop the keg and it rolls down the stairs, which leads to Meatball Brain Tanner having a complete meltdown. What the f don't you understand about not dropping my beer? What? While Tanner is flipping out over the keg, the basement door slams shut and the horror aspect of this horror movie finally begins. Did you guys think we were gonna watch these college kids in their early 30s party the entire time? Well, yeah, we will. So the brothers go into the basement and they find that the keg crashed into the wall and left a hole. Jason peers into this hole, rips apart half of the wall because that's smart, and discovers a secret tunnel. Because this is a horror movie, of course, of course, they crawl into this creepy tunnel. I mean, if you've seen any horror movie in existence, you know that the main characters always throw caution to the wind and wind up in fatal situations. That's just how the cookie crumbles sometimes. So Jason climbs into the tunnel and discovers a secret room that kind of looks like the lights aisle in Home Depot. Eventually, the brothers join Jason in the secret room and Tanner finds a super old chalice. He decides that he's going to drink his beer out of this old, dusty, crusty, musty chalice he found in this secret room he didn't know about five minutes ago at the luau. How sanitary. Then the lights start flashing and the brothers get creeped out. While the other brothers are leaving, Dougie stays behind to do a little more investigation and finds a metal lid on the ground. 
In this next scene, we see Jason staring at Claire from afar, but he's too nervous to go and talk to her. Dougie and Tanner sense his nervousness, and being the good friends that they are, they call him Such a pussy right now. Then, our resident intellectual Tanner gives us the metaphor of the century about love, which I will show you guys right now. I'm sure he's smashed her every single way. Raw dog anal, we hope, but the problem is all those sexual fantasies that he had, they're all mixed up, right? They're like this this burrito. They're mushed together. It'll always be an amazing Claire Jerk burrito when they're all together, but if you take that burrito apart, you take that apart, and you just eat the corn. It's just fucking corn, Dougie. Claire's corn. She's boring. To all the kids watching me right now, never settle for the corn, or the lettuce, or the salsa, or the chicken, or the beans, or even the rice. You deserve your whole burrito. Find your burrito, because you deserve it. So go to your local Chipotle or Taco Bell or local Mexican cuisine place and get your burrito, and let's, let's eat our burritos together, because we deserve it. After this, we get a glimpse into the very wholesome and healthy relationship of Grant and Liza. Basically, Liza's pissed that Grant's doesn't work after he's had a few drinks, and this has taken a huge toll on their sex life. We haven't had sex in a month, Grant, and I want it tonight! Okay. So no drinking until I'm serviced down there. It's the f***ing luau, baby? Yeah, Liza, it's the f***ing luau. Don't you understand how important that is? If Grant wants to drink a beer out of a coconut, wearing a grass skirt surrounded by 200 of his closest friends, then so be it! Get over it, Liza! After another awkward encounter between Jason and Claire, we cut to Dougie trying to figure out where the dusty lid came from. Apparently, he sees letters etched onto the lid, but you really can't even tell even after the camera zooms in. Then Dougie uncovers the entire word, hospice. Hospice? Hospice? Spelling will go on screen right now. And this translates to guest in Latin. Then it cuts to a scene of Wiggles in the bathroom and he sets the camera down while he uses the toilet. I want to point out that this is probably the biggest and the cleanest bathroom I've ever seen in a frat house. I get that this is a movie, but this isn't a realistic portrayal of how frat bathrooms look like in real life. I used a lot of bathrooms in frat houses back when I used to party, and there have been a number of times where there was dirt encrusted in the shower of the bathrooms. I don't know how it got there. You know, maybe they mud wrestle before every party. The point is, if you're expecting this kind of bathroom when you go to a frat party at some point in your life, you're gonna be sorely disappointed. But anyway, Wiggles puts the camera down while he goes to the bathroom and the lights start flickering. Then there's this awfully edited CGI monster that pops out of the shadows. The only thing scary about this scene is the editing job. Like, this looks like something I would have made in my high school TV production class. Then Tanner storms in and gets pissed that Wiggles dares to be in the same bathroom he's in, despite there being multiple stalls as this looks like a public bathroom. Then we cut to Maggie and Claire making the drinks for the luau. Then Tanner comes over and dips the chalice he probably didn't wash right into the alcohol everyone's gonna be drinking. Gross. I'm just finishing putting the rupees in. Oh, Oh, god damn, I am so aroused right now. We watch another weird attempt of Maggie flirting with Tanner, and while Maggie and Claire are talking about Claire's boner for Jason, we see this golden interaction. He's so quiche. Oh god, I do not understand what you see in him. Yeah, you wouldn't because you don't like masculine men. What? That's not true. Claire, you like guys who rollerblade and play frisbee games. I do not. Oh, really? Well then what about Jason? Are you trying to get it in tonight? Fellas, is it gay to rollerblade? Sound off in the comments. To skip ahead a bit, we meet Tanner's 16-year-old brother, Drew, who came up to visit so he can attend the luau. Ah yes, a teenager attending a college party surrounded by drugs and drinking and adults. Nothing wrong with that. We get introduced to him when he grossly flirts with Daphne, the cleaning lady of the frat house. Um, hi, can I help you? Did you just take my picture? I just wanted to show my mom what my new girlfriend looks like. So what time do you have to be back in heaven? Apparently, Drew was supposed to visit the following weekend, but he wanted to come to the luau, so he visited a week early. They start arguing and get into a tussle, and Tanner gets his ass handed to him by a 16-year-old. Oh my god, who are you? Those are some incredible moves. Name's Drew. Is it hot out here or are your boobs just huge? Ugh. 
Afterwards, Daphne goes into the basement to do some laundry and notices the gaping hole in the wall. She shines her phone's flashlight into the hole to see what's in there. Suddenly, something or someone tries to drag her into the hole, and we know this because of the generic sound effect you hear in every horror movie, plus her body awkwardly flailing in the hole. This next part solidifies Daphne as the smartest character thus far, because she hightails it out of the house. While she's running to her car, everyone's like, Daphne, where are you going? And she's like, I'm getting the fuck out of here. That's where I'm going. Good for her. We stand Daphne. After this, Jason receives a call from the medical school he applied to. But judging by his body language on the phone, we the audience can presume he was rejected, unfortunately. A little while later, Liza demands that Grant has to wear the costume she picked out for him at the luau. He puts this hideous outfit on, and the other guys had a lot to say about it. Oh no, dude, come on. Oh my <laughs> god, you look like a douchebag. Thank you, thank you. Oh, 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 He kind of looks like those hula girl figurines you stick on your dashboard. This is school spirit, alright? This is what, this is what pride and devotion looks like. Are you sure about that? Ladies. Ladies, if you're watching me, get you a man that looks like the entirety of Ron John's surf shop throw up on him. Next, we cut to Dougie in his room doing research on the frat house to see why that secret room from earlier is there. He finds out that the previous owner, William Sarkin, threw a dinner party and killed all the guests and his family back in the 60s. Jason doesn't really seem to care, but Dougie is terrified. However, he doesn't have time to freak out because the luau is about to start. While Grant is giving a speech before the other guests arrive, the speakers blow out and makes the house shake. Despite all these paranormal instances, the show must go on. Now, the luau finally begins. Then, the KLP girls make their big entrances, and Grant tries to get Liza to go upstairs with him immediately, because as we saw earlier, Grant has to stay sober because Liza wants to get her cheeks clapped tonight. Liza rejects his advances by saying, Baby, what do you mean? I just want to make you feel good. Come on. Please, you have to get me in the mood. I'm totally turned off right now. Why, why aren't you in the mood? You can say a lot about Liza, but you can't say that she isn't honest. A little later into the party, Dougie's back upstairs doing more research on the house when Drew comes into his room. Drew isn't allowed to go to the party because he's 16, but Dougie can't convince Drew to stay upstairs, so he puts Drew in the bunny costume from earlier in the movie and tells him to keep the head on and just stay away from Tanner so he doesn't get caught. Afterwards, we cut to Tanner and Maggie, our dream couple, and they're playing beer pong and flirting up a storm. Tanner spots two of the KLP pledges, aka the boring, awkward sluts from earlier in the movie, and openly ditches Maggie to go flirt with them. The reason why Tanner ditches Maggie to go flirt with the pledges is because he's determined to have a threesome at the luau for the sixth year in a row, and he sees this as the perfect opportunity to do so. Poor Maggie, though. She just wants her masculine, non-rollerblading, meatball brain boyfriend. The luau continues, and we see Drew getting drunk and trying to party without getting caught by Tanner. Remember how I said he was a teenager? Grant and Liza are arguing because Grant invited his ex, Kate, to the luau, which in my opinion is a little shady. Did you just wave at her? Baby, I'm being hospitable. Her vagina's hospitable. I can't believe you just... I met you. Oh, yeah, right, hardly. What a disgusting... Honestly, I don't blame her for getting upset. You know what? I'm on your side this time, Liza. Honestly, I'd be upset if I was in her position. Then Dougie and another pledge go to the basement and see that all the ice is melted. The pledge runs upstairs to get more ice, and when Dougie is left alone, he starts hearing random noises. Is there someone with me right now? Did you come from the hidden room? <laughs> All right, Teresa Caputo, relax. Then we cut to Jason and Claire awkwardly flirting again. They're talking about their plans after graduation, and Jason lies and says he got into medical school. Although, from what we saw earlier, that's obviously not the case. Their conversation gets cut off, and Jason realizes that Wiggles, who's filming him, heard him lying to Claire about his acceptance to medical school. Dougie is looking at a clip where there is a shadow behind Drew while he's sitting on the stairs, 
And Dougie also found a photo of William Sarkin holding the chalice that Tanner found earlier in the movie. Dougie, at this point, is convinced that the house is haunted, but Jason doesn't want to hear it. Then they all go down to the basement because it's time to put the black lights on, but Grant has Jason do the honors because he thinks that Jason got into medical school. So now the whole party is aware of Jason's lie, although they think it's the truth, but like we know it's a lie that he didn't get into medical school. Everyone's partying in the basement and Drew is beyond drunk. While he's filming himself, he runs to the bathroom to throw up. Suddenly the lights start blinking and the horrible CGI monster from earlier pops out of the mirror and kills Drew thus making him the first victim of the movie. But meanwhile everyone is partying and suddenly the lights go out and the music stops. Everyone's super confused. Dougie and Jason run to the basement to see if there's an issue with the fuse box. Dougie's flashlight shuts off and Wiggles turns on the night vision camera to see. He points the light at Dougie and Jason and we see that awful CGI demon from earlier just chilling behind Jason. Then the lights turn back on and Wiggles plays the footage back and it turns out there was nothing behind Jason, although we know, we know, we know Wiggles, we believe you. Suddenly they hear a growl from behind them. They turn around and there's a bright light coming from inside the tunnel. Again, this establishes Daphne as the smartest person in the movie because they go back into the creepy tunnel now with the light on. So they go into the secret room and all the lights on the wall are turned on, but instead of getting the out of the house. They just go back to the luau like nothing's happening. After this, we cut to Tanner and the two KLP sisters from earlier in his room about to have a threesome. Tanner snorts another line of Coca-Cola. And things are slowly heating up. There's enough tea for the both of you. <laughs> now, let me see you kiss and make up. Oh yes! Let's fetishize lesbians, as if we needed that after watching all the toxic masculinity and unhealthy relationship dynamics we've seen so far. How cool is that? I, I love it here. I, I really do love it here. But as they're getting into it, Tanner pours a line of Coca-Cola inside one of the girl's shoulder blades. When he goes to snort it, it turns into the face of a demon and Tanner flies across the room. The girls get weirded out and they leave. Womp womp. I guess Tanner's not getting his threesome this year after all. Don't go, no. I don't think so. No, let's do another line. I got a big My d Let's play with it. Let's have fun. Let's play with you. Tanner goes back to the party and the brothers ask how the threesome went. Tanner calls the girls crazy because of what happened, but he's still on the hunt for his threesome. Dougie takes the chalice from Tanner and starts drinking from it. This might not seem important now, but we'll revisit that later. So the luau is still going strong despite all the creepy that's happened so far. You know, because it's a f luau. It's the only time of year you can sniff a used condom from the floor of a frat house. Who wants to miss that opportunity? Then, uh-oh, Grant starts drinking, which is not good news for Liza. We cut to Dougie sitting at the bar with the chalice and the lid he found in the secret room. He puts the lid on top of the chalice and realizes that the word horrificum, which means horrible or awful in Latin, is written on the side of the chalice. If we remember from earlier, the word hospice is written on top of the lid, so together it says horrificum hospice or horrible guest. And this makes Dougie freak out for like the 35th time thus far. Now we're back to Jason as he's watching Claire from afar. Maggie's standing right next to Jason and she notices that he's still nervous to go and talk to Claire. So she gives Jason this really weird pep talk where she basically calls him gay. You two are so annoying. Stop being such a puss. Go over there and change that girl's life. Unless you like dudes. You like dudes? No. If you like dudes, that's fine. I get it. I love dudes. I've been eyeing these dudes all night. What do you think of that guy? He's hot, right? He looks like he really knows how to kiss a girl. So I ask again, fellas, is it gay to be nervous? Let me know. Normal friends would be like, you got this, there's nothing to worry about, but not Maggie here. Maggie's like, you're too scared to talk to this girl, so you must like dudes. Okay. But apparently this pep talk worked because Jason finally went over to talk to Claire. And then there's a montage of them hanging out and dancing. So now we cut back to Dougie doing more research on the house. He finds an interview from 1974 with William Sarkin's daughter, Miranda. If you don't remember who William is, he's the previous owner of the frat house and the guy who killed all the people at the dinner party. Sounds like a lovely dude. But to give a quick summary of this interview, Miranda said that her father changed when he came back from a research trip in Europe. 
While she was little, CPS came and took her away from her family because someone at her school found scratches and bruises across her torso. Before Miranda was sent to her aunt's house, her mother said that William was influenced by a demon that he invited into their home, which is why he killed all the guests at his dinner party. Again, he sounds like a wonderful man. So Dougie is flipping out now. Again, surprise, surprise. And he runs back into the party to try and warn everyone, but no one really gives a because they're all drunk out of their minds. In this next scene, we cut back to Liza and Grant, and Grant is clearly drunk at this point. He tries to make another move on Liza, but she smells the alcohol in his breath, and she flips out. At this point, Grant has had enough. Because, you know, it's the f***ing luau. If little Granty wants to drink, he's gonna f***ing drink, and you can't stop him. Okay, you know what? You are f***ing insane. I'm done with this. This is the Luau, all right? It's the best party of the year. And if I want to drink, oh, oh, baby, I'm going to drink. So get over it. Excuse me, did you just call me a Yes, he did. Also, I have no idea where that voice just came from. Honestly, it sounds like they dubbed this random girl's voiceover in post-production. Yes, he did. Who's that? By this point, Grant and Liza have both proven to be equally unlikable, so I guess they are a match made in heaven. Or hell, because this is a scary movie and there's a demon in the house. However, the party must go on, and now that Grant and Liza are donezo, Grant can finally drink. With his ex, nonetheless. <laughs> That's a little awkward. <laughs> Thank you so much, Grant. We established that like 30 minutes ago and barely anything's happened since. Now Dougie finds Maggie and asks if she knows where Jason is. As opposed to giving Dougie a normal answer, this is what she has to say. Dougie, listen to me right now. You leave him the f alone. He is with my girl and she has had a rough life. And if you beaver damn that because of this You could have just said no. So no. I haven't seen him. Thank you. Afterwards, Dougie goes to their shared bedroom to look for Jason, but he's not there. Meanwhile, Jason and Claire are finally hanging out after gawking at each other from afar the entire party. So Dougie calls Jason, but he doesn't reach him. Dougie leaves a voicemail explaining what's going on until he hears a thump from the closet. He goes to check it out, and it's just Drew in the bunny suit. Or so we think. Because remember, he died, like, ten minutes ago? That sucked. Dougie thinks it's a prank until he takes off the mask, and Drew's dead. I mean, we've gotten a taste of scary scenes here and there, but really, we've just been watching a bunch of 30-year-old college students parting in grass skirts the entire time. But now, with less than a half an hour left in the movie, we finally arrive to the scary part. Brace yourselves. So Dougie tries to run out of the bedroom, but oh no! The door slams shut and won't open. Then he tries to escape through the window, but that's locked too. While he's banging on the glass, the awful CGI demon makes an appearance again. We should give him a name at this point because CGI demon doesn't really do it for me. So let's just call him Ted. Ted the demon. So Ted appears in the windows and somehow the camera gets knocked over and Dougie gets dragged into the closet. Now we're back with Jason and Claire sitting on the bouncy slide outside of the house. Claire was supposed to leave early because she's attending a cancer walk for her mom's memorial fund the next morning, but she decides to stick around and talk to Jason. During their conversation, Claire confides in Jason and tells him the story of how her mother died. This piece of information might not seem too relevant, but just wait. While Jason and Claire were talking, Maggie and Tanner are spying on them. All of a sudden, they start making out. If it seems like there are a lot of couples in this movie, that's because there are. I feel like we've watched them make out more than we've seen actual horror scenes. Speaking of couples, now we're back with Kate and Grant. And if you don't remember who Kate is, that's Grant's ex that he invited to the party. So messy. They finally snuck into Grant's room and they're getting right to f But in the heat of the moment, someone bangs on the door. They move past it and continue on. But while Kate's on top of Grant, suddenly our buddy Ted is back and he's ready to kill these 
Suddenly, Kate dies on top of Grant, and now Grant is trapped in his room with his dead ex-girlfriend. This is a classic example of the death by sex trope that you see in a lot of horror movies. If you don't know what I mean by the death by sex trope, it's basically when the couple in the horror movie gets caught by the killer or the antagonist of the movie and gets murdered. Three better horror movies that do this trope are Halloween, Friday the 13th, and Nightmare on Elm Street. So you might have seen it in there. And there's also a bunch of other horror movies that have done it as well. In the meantime, Jason and Claire are walking by and hear all the banging coming from Grant's room. They assume this is from Liza and Grant getting it on because they don't know that they broke up, but really it's just Grant getting thrown across his room like a ragdoll. To skip ahead a bit, Jason and Claire are in the kitchen when they bump into Liza. They're confused because they thought Liza and Grant were having sex in Grant's room, but Liza told them that they got into a fight and she finds out that Grant cheated on her. Jason tries to cover the truth for Grant, but the awkward, boring sluts from earlier in the movie. They tell Liza the truth. Liza is obviously pissed off, so she storms upstairs to confront Grant. Oh, open the door! I know you're in there with that stupid whore! Okay, Dr. Seuss. Liza finally breaks into the room and finds Grant and Kate dead on the floor. The door locks behind her, and you guessed it, Ted kills her in the bathroom. So finally, Jason and Claire get some alone time away from everyone, and with only 20 minutes left of the movie, they kiss. Nothing can ruin this moment, right? Well, you're wrong. Suddenly, right in the middle of the luau, a demonic growl interrupts the fight going on in the basement. There's a high-pitched buzzing noise and a guy is shaking on the ground. Tanner flips him over and he's dead. Not to spoil anything, but I'm going to be spoiling everything. I'm going to be talking about death a lot in these next few minutes, so if you're not into that, you might want to skip ahead a little bit. Okay, back to the luau. As you'd expect, everyone is flipping out and running for the hills, but Jason and Claire have obviously not caught on because they're making out in Jason's room, you know, as you do while your friends are getting chased by a demon. Then Jason gets up to turn Dougie's security camera off when he finds a dead Drew in the closet. Then they find Dougie passed out underneath the bed holding the chalice. So now it's time for them to get out. People are dying left and right. Remember the awkward, boring sluts from the beginning of the movie? Well, they're dead. NASCAR, the pledge who couldn't carry the keg down the stairs to save his life? He's dead too. And Dougie? That's to be determined. Now, Jason, Claire, and Wiggles are trying to escape, but all the doors are locked and the only way out is through the living room where Ted the Demon is. Now we cut to our good old meatball brain Tanner, and he stumbles into the living room with this very weird look on his face. He looks like he's possessed by presumably Ted, and he comes over to grab the camera. To be honest, it kind of looks like the beginning of a weird TikTok POV video. Then Maggie is screaming for Tanner to get out, but Tanner is obviously not listening. There's a growl, and suddenly Tanner throws Maggie across the room, and she's now dead. I didn't understand this part the first time I watched the movie, but let me explain. The reason why Tanner is possessed is because he drank out of the chalice that was holding Ted the demon. Him and presumably a lot of other people also got possessed and died because they drank out of this chalice. So basically, like, Ted is inside of Tanner. That sounds really weird out of context. Tanner is possessed because he drank chalice that Ted was holding. It's kind of like an Aladdin with the genie lamp and the genie was in there, except like everyone's dead. After this, Tanner starts drinking again. I mean, read the room, buddy. And he pans the camera and Ted is poorly edited behind him. I like how Ted is smiling into the camera right before he kills Tanner. Like, he knows this is his big moment and he doesn't want to it up. If this seems weird, that's because it is, and it only gets weirder. But right after we say bye-bye to Maggie and Tanner, Wiggles, Jason, and Claire are still trying to escape. But before they can run, Ted kills Wiggles. Now Jason and Claire run to the secret safe room to turn all the lights on so Ted doesn't come out of the shadows to kill them. This part goes on forever because they can't find the damn light switch. But then again, if I was in their situation, I'd be too paralyzed by fear to even get to this point, so... Props to them. But they turn the lights on and now they're safe. Right? Well, you're wrong. In fact, they're anything but safe. They're sitting around waiting for the police to come when Daphne, who I formerly considered the smartest person in the movie because she knew to hightail it out of there, comes back into the secret room. It turns out that William Sarkin is her grandfather and Daphne has to kill someone in order to contain Ted the demon who originally possessed her grandfather. But stabbing Jason didn't work, so now Daphne has to murder Claire. Her reason for this is because Claire survived the death of her mother. Where's the correlation in that? I don't really know. I still haven't figured it out, and I've seen this movie twice. It's the only way to stop it. No, you have to die. Please, I didn't do anything. Close your eyes while I murder you, Claire. 
So Claire's like, you're nuts. I'm out of here. So she runs back up to the living room. Surprise, Dougie's back from the dead. And he winds up murdering Claire. But apparently that does something because Ted gets sucked back into the basement. Not to worry, though. Dougie did say sorry. Claire, I heard everything. I'm sorry. Because saying sorry is going to unslit her throat. Good call. But to make the film come full circle, we're brought back to the 911 phone call from the very beginning of the movie and the police pull up to the Sigma Tau fraternity house. Dougie is sitting in front of the door with the chalice and lid in his hand with a blank expression on his face. He glances at the camera and the movie's over. 